I am so excited this morning. We are starting a brand new series called Uncommon. How many know that I'm pretty uncommon? Y'all are like, you don't have to tell us twice. So, but I need to start my sermon this morning by asking you for forgiveness. I need to repent this morning, both in this church and to those who are watching on YouTube. I pulled a common media flaw and spoke about an issue before knowing all the facts last week. My point last Sunday is that racism exists and that I hate it. Yesterday with boots on the ground, I was told by some demonic people that because I was white, I could not go to heaven, but instead I would spend eternity in captivity. I felt the racism in this neighborhood. It's not easy being a pastor. And I will make mistakes, and I have made a lot of mistakes so far in my first month. And I ask you to please forgive me. This world is hard, and it's not easy being black. It's not easy being white. It's not easy being a true, blood-washed believer in Christ. It's not easy being a white kid in a black neighborhood when you see your black friends being mistreated and kicked and cuffed and put on a 100-degree pavement because of their skin color and you're told to go home because of yours. I'm not trying to offend anyone. When I started here as your pastor, you said that I was part of your family, and family does not get offended. Family forgives. And so please forgive me if I have said or done anything that offended you. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm trying to get us out of the church building and into the streets to make a difference in the ghettos of America and start making a difference through social justice. We need to take a stand against racism and police brutality and also against those who are victims that are turning their anger towards cops and killing cops that are doing great work. The bottom line is black lives matter as much as blue lives, as much as white lives. Red, yellow, black, brown, green, blue, tan, and white, they are all precious in his sight and all lives matter. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Psalms 120, 6 and 7. This morning, I'm asking you for forgiveness and for your grace. In fact, the title of my message this morning is Uncommon Grace. What if we lived our lives uncommon? What if we lived uncommon lives? What if we show uncommon grace and uncommon love? What if we have uncommon outreach? And what if we become an uncommon church? and an uncommon people. I've been through a lot this week, and I've had some people rise up against me, and I've had some people speak evil of me and, and, and bring my integrity into question, and it hurts. And I'm being transparent with you because we're family. But I just wonder what would happen if we started to live uncommon. I can promise you that there's gonna be more attacks. Because when you're living for Jesus and you're trying your best, people are going to hate you. He promised you that. Matter of fact, if the devil doesn't hate you, you're probably not doing anything. So, please watch this video. First time I saw it, and I'm sitting over there crying like a baby. Um, you have to forgive me this morning. Someone that I considered my brother and someone that I considered my closest friend killed me this week. And uh, as I was making that intro video, I sat in my office and I said, man, that's the kind of person I want to be. (laughs) And you can ask my kids, I'm not a crier. And Jackie came in my office, and my office is a mess. And she said, this is what your life is like. I said, yeah, it's a mess. Um, See, we don't become pastors because we're perfect people. We become pastors because we're broken people willing to help other people that are broken.
So, as you watch that video, who are you willing to fight to bring a tutu and be made fun of? Chase and I went to dinner last night, and um, we went to Texas Roadhouse, and we sat there, and, and there's just chaos all around us, and, and uh, I went to order my steak medium, and he said, no, 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 get it medium rare, and that way if it's too far under, you can get it. So I said, all right, all right. And so I ordered it medium rare, and I was pretty broken, and uh, Chase and I had been talking about what's going on, and, and the Holy Spirit needed, no, he knew that this chubby guy needed a good steak. And I'm telling you, this was the best steak I've ever had. I've been all over the world doing ministry, and I've had steaks that are $75, $100, ridiculous. People take you out when you're, when you're a guest. And this steak was so good and so perfect and so seasoned that I, I asked them to go get the chef. And here comes this young black kid that was probably 20, and he's shaking a little bit because he's afraid we're going to complain. And I said, I said, I just want you to know. Chase kept me up really late last night, too, so I'm, some of this is because I'm tired. But I just want you to know that that's the best steak I ever had. And his eyes welled up with tears, and he said, is that really why you brought me out here? And I said, I just want to honor you for taking the time to do things right. I don't think we honor each other enough. And Sister Sheila this morning said, it, you know, sometimes crying is a good release. And um, when I was a kid, I was in a very abusive home, and I was told crying was for girls. And that if I was going to cry, I'd, I'd be given something to cry about. And so it's hard for me to... To, to cry, but I guess the secret is is a good steak and staying up too late. <laughs> so check this, this verse out. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them. When I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying know the Lord for they will all know me for the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin and I will remember no more thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order by the moon and the stars by light by night who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord of hosts, in his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. That's it. So, <clears throat> aren't you glad we're under a new covenant? And aren't you glad? Can you imagine a God that loves us so much that he calls us his people? Man, for so long I felt like a slave. And now to be called a friend and to be God, God's people. And Sister Sheila said the best way you can deal with hurt and rejection and people speaking evil against you is to forgive them. And I said, you know, normally I would be angry, but I'm not angry, I'm hurt. And sometimes I think it's harder to forgive when you're hurt than when you're angry. But it's quite funny that I'm talking about uncommon grace. Grace. 
God did not make us reservoirs able to store up great quantities of love, joy, faith, or grace. Instead, God gives us what we need and when we need it. When I was a kid, my grandmother used to call, use a term called JIT. Has anyone ever heard of JIT? They use it in the Great Depression. JIT, J-I-T. She said, God ain't early and he ain't late. He's always JIT. So what does JIT stand for? Somebody said it. See, I've had, I've had uh, as I'm looking up this, I wanted to know if maybe this was something my grandmother made up. And so I thought, well, what could it stand for? Maybe Jeremiah's in trouble. Maybe it's Jesus in time. Maybe. But in fact, JIT is short for just in time. My grandmother would say, God ain't working yet. He's working JIT. That's the term for how many manufacturers handle the inventories of materials they use to create their products. I didn't know this was a real word until I looked it up. In fact, JIT is a major shift in the inventory management. In the old days, to ensure that their production lines were always running, manufacturers acquired substantial quantities of material, and they kept restocking those supplies as the parts were used. But here's the problem with that. Huge amounts of money must be kept in flow, and this adds cost for the use of that money as well. Warehouses are needed to store all that material. Standing inventories have built in risks from fire, theft, flood, wind, infestation, and obsoleteness. These risks raise the cost of manufacturing, even if the materials were even if they were insured, which itself is an additional expense. The possibilities always exists that innovations to the manufacturer and the manufactured items might become available and this would delay and then the unused existing inventory would have to be used up. Eventually, however, the JIT way of handling inventory emerged. It scheduled materials to arrive just in time, thus reducing the risks and the cost. Ironically, although the concept was first used by the Ford Motor Company as described by Henry Ford in his 1923 book, my life and work. It did not fully get implemented there for a long time. In the auto manufacturing world, it was Toyota who first made it work, and they remodeled their JIT system not on Ford, but on a supermarket chain, Piggly Wiggly. They figured out how to use it in the grocery business. JIT is a big improvement, but it's not perfect because it suffers interruptions suffers interruptions in the supply line. If, for example, a strike occurs on one of the suppliers, it can have a domino effect up the line. A problem in the transportation industry will telegraph itself pretty quickly to manufacturers as well. But all in all, JIT inventory is more cost effective and the older method, and of course, manufacturers are always looking for ways to increase profitability, sustainability, and innovation. JIT. See, Jeremiah experienced jit. Our reading from Jeremiah is about God's grace. <clears throat> Jeremiah had his troubles, but in this text, we read of the failure of the people of Israel to keep the Mosaic covenant. Covenant. So God, instead of abandoning them, promised them a different kind of covenant, one where the law would be not written on tablets of stone, but in the tablets of their hearts. The church has understood the coming of Jesus, a major fulfillment of the new covenant. But even we, under that covenant, aren't so much conscious of God's grace as the overcharging and ridiculous thing and the principle that we live under this JIT philosophy. In other words, God's economic and his system works on JIT. God did not make us a reservoir able to store up great quantities of love and joy and faith and peace. Instead, God gives us what we need just in time. For example, Exodus 16 illustrates JIT's grace. God supplies the Israelites with manna only for a day at a time. It was delivered just in time, and each day's quantity had to be eaten that day. Any that they tried to hold for the next day would spoil under God's hand. God cared for them. The Israelites learned, but it was on a day-by-day basis. He didn't stock up their large storehouses. He didn't give them silos to store up manna. 
You know, when I think about manna, I think about the traducan. If you've never had traducan, it's amazing. And, and, I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a turkey stuffed in a duck, stuffed, stuck, stuffed in a chicken, or the other way around, a chicken and a duck inside of a turkey. And I don't know if Filipinos make traducan, but I would like some traducan this year. I've only had it one time, and I'll tell you, it was slap your mama good. So we hear this jit philosophy in verses like this one from Isaiah. Oh, Lord, be gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our arm every morning, Isaiah 33, 2. And this passage from Lamentations, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new every morning, 3, 22 and 23. Jeremiah himself seemed to have jit grace in mind when elsewhere in his book he spoke of God has strength every morning, our salvation also in time of distress, Jeremiah 16, 19. Likewise, Jesus alluded to daily jit grace as part of his routine of his life when he said not to worry about what we will eat, drink, or wear, and added that you, Heavenly Father, know what we need, and we need all these things, Matthew 6, 31 through 32. And Jesus included jit grace as a subject in the model of prayer he gave his disciples with this petition. Give us this day our daily bread. Asking for daily bread meant asking for all the necessities of the spirit, soul, and body. And it's an apt metaphor for our present needs today. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians saying that the Lord told him that his grace was sufficient, consider actual bread. Consider bread. So if you can start to think about bread, and as we celebrate communion today, think about bread. In recent years, the food industry has figured out how to add preservatives to store-bought bread that would prolong its freshness for several days. But if you've ever baked fresh bread, you know it's superior. If you've ever baked bread, even in those newfangled bread makers. As a kid, my grandmother would make bread on on the granite. And she would slap this bread and it would turn into these balls of of dough and then the gases would leak and she would make this amazing bread. And it was the humblest looking bread you've ever had. And sometimes my friends would come over for dinner and they would sort of scoff at this bread because it wasn't white bread in a white package. And no, that's not a racial thing. It was literally one of those things where I would watch her, nobody got that, and everybody's all tense now. It's okay if you laugh, it was just a joke. I'm a white guy, I can make white bread jokes. Anyway. So please don't, please don't get offended. I'm sorry. Once again, I look, Chase is like, oh, why did you say that? So as I'm, as I'm watching this bread, as I'm, he's literally going like this. As I'm watching this bread, we'll call it brown bread. That way everybody's safe. It's a shade of brown. I'm watching her make this bread and I'm watching the artwork and I'm watching her punch this bread and I'm watching it and then when she would split it open and that that heat would come from it. But she would tell us, she'd say, sugar, you gotta eat this bread now. This bread won't keep. And I'd say, yes ma'am, you don't have to tell me. As I told you guys before, I'm a good eater. And so she would put, we would have bread and then if there was any left in the morning, she would slice tomatoes. She would take mayonnaise. She'd put mayonnaise on this bread, and then we'd have tomato sandwiches. And then if there was any left over, she would get fresh cucumbers from the garden, and we would have cucumber sandwiches. See, if y'all weren't raised in the South, you don't appreciate the tomato sandwich. And if you were raised in the hood, you probably appreciate the mayonnaise sandwich. Because sometimes that's all. I was, <laughs> we were talking about that yesterday. I can remember having mustard sandwiches like, there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more to life than this. So... We see that bread doesn't last. But if you've ever baked your own bread, you understand why. Before preservatives, bread needed to be made fresh every day. Bread does not keep. It's fresh from the oven, and for a few hours after that, bread is a wonderful food. If you steal it, and you, I mean, if you, look, I'm thinking stealing. I'm sorry. Look, Chase is like, don't say steal. Um, If you seal it up in something plastic, You can keep air from it. You can keep it soft for a day or two. But that second day, it's not nearly as good as when it's fresh and it's new and it's baked fresh for you. That's what used to get me and my brother. Sometimes she would make these little loaves just for us. And she would say, now that's your bread. 
You can do whatever you want with it. And she would put different meats out, and she would put these things. My grandmother knew how to treat children. She knew how to honor children, especially children that came to her broken and hungry for the summer. I'm not going to cry anymore. I feel like I'm, I'm on uh, Sports Center when they start asking those tough questions when people are retiring. You ain't going to get me. I'm not going to cry. So by the third or fourth day, green mold starts to appear on that bread. And, of course, you can keep the mold away by not sealing up the bread. But the only problem with that is within hours it turns stale and hard. So for centuries, the only way people had good and tasty bread was to make it every single day. I lived in New York City for a while, and and, and at like 2 o'clock in the morning, they would start making bread, and you could see flour pouring out of the streets. And if you caught them just right and you had the right smile, they would throw you a loaf of bread. And man, I'm telling you, that flour in the air and that hot bread in your hand, there's nothing like it. Um, So when Jesus tells his disciples and us to pray for daily bread, he's implying that the blessings of God are given for immediate use, for the present moment, and that we are never self-sufficient. You see, JIT, his grace is not for the past. It's just in time. We once heard a minister pray something like this. We thank thee, O Lord, for all the blessings you have given us. He went on to to talk about some of them. But then he said, but oh Lord, we know that we cannot live on past blessings. So please give us today what we need. Our experience of life tells us that ministers who pray correctly know what JIT is. JIT grace is not for the future either. While in a Nazi prison for resisting Hitler, Bonhoeffer wrote this. I believe that God will give us all strength we need to help us resist in all the times of distress, but he never gives us it in advance, lest we should rely on ourselves and not on him alone. Just as we cannot sustain our outer life on past meals or promises of future ones, neither can we sustain our inner life on past blessings or promises of future ones. Consider the almost constant unease we live in with our body and in our world. Terrorist threats, rogue nations seeking nuclear capabilities, financial instability, job security, housing problems, worries about our loved one, health concerns, and so on and so forth. Sometimes we forget about JIT. Don't forget JIT. Consider that the context of JIT grace, we might want a lifetime of assurance all at once, but wouldn't we be inclined to, as Bonhoeffer suggests, reply and rely on ourselves and not on God alone? It's easier for a rich man to enter, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's because the rich man doesn't have any needs He doesn't need God because he has become God. He forgot about jit, grace. Give us today our daily bread as a plea for day-by-day provision, not for a lifetime of security. One day, with the ancient rabbi, Ben Jokey, was teaching his students about the miracle of the manna in the wilderness. And one of his students asked him why God did this. Why didn't he furnish enough manna for the Israelites at one time to last the entire year? Because he could have. How many know he could have? How many know he could have made this crazy, frozen, floating bread that had quail in it? I mean, I think it was like a hot pocket. That's what I think of when I think of manna. Or lumpia, for instance. Some of y'all are like, if he says lumpia one more time... We ain't making lumpia ever. That's the last time. Okay, somebody said amen, so I I won't say it again. Um, Just remember my birthday. All right. The rabbi answered him with this parable. Once there was a rich man who had a son to whom he promised an annual allowance. Every year on the same day, he would give his son the entire amount. After a while, it happened that the only time the father saw his son was on that day of the year when he was to receive his allowance. So the father changed his plan and gave the son only enough for each day. The next day, the son had to return to receive the next day's allowance. From then on, the father saw his son every day. 
As hard as it is for many of us to grasp this, God apparently wants to see us every day. Give us today our daily bread. In short, it's a powerful expression of our day-by-day dependence on God and his dependence on us. He loves you. Believe it or not, he likes you. No matter how far you've run, no matter how much stupid things you've done, no matter what situation you've put yourself in, he wants you to come to him and say, give me today just enough and give it to me just in time. Let me tell you something, church, and those watching on YouTube, there's nothing that you have done, there's no distance that you have ran that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. There are other ways we can pray. Give me what I need for today, O Lord, or help me to be your person today. Make me faithful just for today. In recovery, we teach people day by day. And some people can't get through the day without smoking crack or drinking alcohol or doing meth or slamming heroin. So we tell them, let's do 10 minutes at a time. And some people can't get through 10 minutes. So we say, let's do one minute at a time. Maybe you're one of those people that needs to do 30 seconds at a time. Maybe you need to check in with the father 30 seconds at a time. Father, I'm struggling. Dad, I'm struggling. Give me this hour my daily bread. Give me this moment my daily bread. Whatever vocabulary we use, the point is to trust God day by day. And the challenge for us is to see that such daily provisioning is enough. In 1939, Hitler's troops invaded Poland, an act that would soon bring Britain into war. In the autumn, C.S. Lewis delivered a sermon at the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin in Oxford, England. In the congregation that day were a young men who realized Britain would soon be at war, and they had no idea whether they would live or die, or even whether the world as they knew it would survive. Here's a little of what Lewis said that day. A more Christian attitude which can be maintained and attained at any age, is that of leaving future plans in God's hands. We may as well, for God, will certainly retain it whether we leave it into him or not. Never in peace or war commit your virtue or your happiness to the future. Happy work is best done by the man who takes the long-term plans somewhat lightly and works from moment to moment. As to the Lord, it is only our daily bread that we can be encouraged to ask for. The present is the only time in which any duty can be done or any grace received. Surely that's right, isn't it? The present is the only time in which anything can be done or any grace received. How many times have we ended up a day exhausted in multiple dimensions and wondered where we would get the strength to continue tomorrow How many have been there? How many of you have been so exhausted by the end of the day, you say, that's it? That's it. There's no way I can get up and do this tomorrow. But see, God has promised us strength with JIT. But that's sufficient. The reliability of the supplier and assurance of on-time delivery is not a question. If the day has extra demands on us, If the events of our day bring us unease, it's important to recall with Jeremiah that God is our strength every morning, our salvation also in the time of distress. The key to having this grace, this jit grace when we need it, is to stay connected to the supplier, just like the Ford Motor Company. In other words, Jesus in time. When you replace the clock with Jesus and he's your supplier, there comes a lot of freedom in that. Well, how am I going to get this done? Jesus. Well, how am I going to feed my kids? Jesus. How am I going to pay my life? Jesus. When you start to interrupt your own thoughts with that just-in-time kind of Jesus, things are going to change. God doesn't give us grace and guidance ahead of time for whatever eventualities may arise. He gives us daily bread. The new covenant is continually 
with, but different than the old covenant. He called us his people. He said that no longer am I gonna write these commandments and these rules on tablets. I'm gonna write them on your heart so that I might not sin against God. The new covenant is begun with Jesus, but it's not completely fulfilled until the kingdom of heaven comes into all of its fullness. In the meantime, we need to be practicing kingdom ethics and kingdom living. We need to become uncommon. So this morning, and I probably won't get through this, When I think about what Jesus did for me on the cross, and when I think about the fact that when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane and he begged his dad, please, if there's any way I can get out of this. When my sons were little and I would have to paddle them, they would say, Dad, please, I'm sorry. Please. Especially Corbin. They used to call Corbin, Corbin Sales, because he could sell ketchup popsicles to a woman in white gloves. And sometimes I would be laughing because he was so good at it. What if I promise to never say another bad word my whole life, keep my room clean for 10 years, and marry the girl you choose for me? Then can I not get a paddle? And I would say, (laughs) those are some, if I could get a contract, yes. But since you're four, no. And how many know most of the time when we, when we paddle our kids, this means more than anything. This sometimes, just that swat on the diaper hurts their feelings because they know we're disappointed. I don't want you to get into your mind that I beat my kids. Now, my kids will probably tell you, yes, he does, but I don't. Because you know what? I believe that if you paddle your children in the very beginning and you train a child in the way he should go and you spare the child by spoiling the rod early enough, now I can look at my kids, and if I put my hand like this, if you ever see me put my hand like this, watch my kids sit up straight. Especially if I'm in this pulpit, oh, you best believe. This means the next one, the next time I have to look at you, it's on. And there's no forgiveness, there's no maybe not. It means don't talk to me on the way home, it's on. How many know it's okay to paddle your kids? Now, I'm not saying beat your kids. I'm not saying abuse your children. But what I'm saying is some of these kids that run around here and they MF this and they scream at their parents in the grocery store, I'll walk over and I'll say, you know, if you bust that butt, things will change. So how many know that God the Father had to sort of explain to Jesus, this is what's best for you? I'm not paddling you because I don't love you. I'm paddling because I love you. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He knew he was going to be broken. He knew he was going to suffer. They just thought they were having some sandwich bread. They thought they were having what I was talking about where my grandmother made this fresh bread. And I can imagine he did it with tears in his eyes. Because when he was in the garden, he sweated blood. He was so nervous and so overwhelmed with emotion that he said, please, Father, If there's any way, let this cup pass from me. When the supper was over, he took that cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, 
your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and of this juice and this wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other. One in ministry to all of the world until Christ comes in his final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Almighty Father, now and forever. And let me explain for those of you that have never asked Christ into your heart. For those of you on YouTube that are watching this, I've seen people come to the Lord through communion. See, we have what's called an open table, which means you don't have to be a Methodist. You don't even have to be a Christian. If you heard something here today and you want to experience what we're talking about, I invite you to come to this table. When we're finished with communion, I'm going to give you a chance to receive Christ as Savior. It's not popular to do altar calls. It's not popular. But I don't really care what's popular. I care that each one of you that feels lonely and broken leaves here feeling loved and whole. And so as our servers come that are ready for communion, I just pray that we would search our hearts. And if you need to come to these altars and, and sort of get before God before you take this bread and before you take this grape juice, I challenge you to do that. But just know that nothing that you have done can separate you from the love of the Father. And his body was broken and his blood was shed for you.